guys, Kelly with St. John's County Parks and Recreation here once again to give you an awesome presentation that I wish I could give in person, um, but hopefully soon that will be able to happen. So this week I really want to celebrate sea turtles because May 1st is the kickoff of sea turtle nesting season. And there's lots of really great information out there about sea turtles. So first and foremost, who I am, what I do, I work for St. John's County. St. John's County has about 42 miles of coastline running from Ponte Vedra down to about the marine land area. We have awesome beaches here that the sea turtles absolutely love. I specifically work for our Parks and Recreation Department. Our Parks and Rec Department is a really diverse department that handles things from ball fields to playgrounds to trails two beach access points and waterway access points. So we have a whole division um, called Beaches that handles all things beach related and they also work hand in hand with all of the people who work on sea turtles. What I do, I have the best job in the whole wide world. I've said it once and I'll say it again because it is awesome. In a non-pandemic world, I'm out there on the beach with you all talking about this type of stuff. Um, I do a lot of field work outside, doing surveys and things to keep our parks nice and healthy. I give talks like these in person and lead kayak trips. I basically have an awesome job that keeps me outside enjoying our wonderful natural areas here in St. John's County. So like I said, we're gonna talk about sea turtles today and they're one of my favorite animals. So I'm super excited to share this with you. So first and foremost, sea turtles are reptiles. And the key things that make reptiles reptiles, that make turtles turtles, is that they are vertebrates. So if you take a look at this picture here, you can see that their spine is actually part of their shell. So there are no naked turtles running around. That little cartoon where the turtle pops out of the shell and the shell spins around, yeah, that would never happen. Because just like if we popped out of our body and left our vertebrate behind us, that would not be good news. So these guys grow with their vertebrae, with their shells. They have leathery eggs. Now this is important specifically for sea turtles because those eggs are typically dropping far distances and you wouldn't want those eggs to crack if they were hard like a chicken egg. They have scales, or in the case of turtles, they have scoops. Um, they're cold blooded, meaning they get their warmth from the area around them, which in a sea turtle's case is going to be the temperature of the ocean and they breathe air. That's really important, it seems super logical, but a lot of times people think that things that live in water have gills, but they're just like you and me. When they go underneath the water, they're holding up their breath. Now they're much better at holding their breath than we are. They can hold it for a lot longer, um, but they do have to hold their breath when they go underwater. Some super basic anatomy. These guys have a large shell, and the top part is called the carapace and they have flippers and if you were actually to look inside of a flipper it would look a lot like our hand or our bones in there the bottom of that shell the underside the belly of the turtle is going to be called the plastron and then it has a tail and it has a head and in fact that tail is the only way to really tell boy sea turtles from girl sea turtles so until they're adults you can't tell the difference at all just from looking at them they look pretty much exactly the same but when they become adults and they're full grown, female sea turtles will have a shorter tail and a male sea turtle will have a longer tail. I will let you infer why the males have a longer tail and what's happening there and keep a PG. Um, but yeah, that tail is really the only way to tell boys apart from girls. And once again, that's only when they're adults. When they're juveniles, when they're babies, they look exactly the same. So before we get too far down the turtle road, I do want to pay homage to the tortoise um, because on our beaches here, a lot of times when people see something with a shell on the sand, they automatically assume it's a turtle or specifically a sea turtle. And that's just not true because we have gopher tortoises here. So sea turtles have distinctive flippers. Those flippers are awesome for swimming. Great for swimming. That's what they're made for. They live in the ocean. They can't fit their head in their shell. They can only move their head side to side. 
and they're huge. They're gigantic. The smallest sea turtle that we have here, that nests here, is about 100 pounds. So they're huge, huge. Tortoises, which can be found on the sand because they live up in the dune systems, and they are known to come down to the water's edge and sit there in the water, let the water rush over them, and you know, take a little bath basically, and then go back up to the dunes. But they can't swim. They live on land, they have feet, they have distinctive feet that look like elephant feet. And they can actually hide their whole head inside their shell. And they're a lot smaller, they're like the size of a dinner plate. So I said earlier that sea turtles were my, um, well, one of my favorite animals, but my favorite animal are gopher tortoises. So I just want to share my favorite gopher tortoise with you. This is Augie. This is our non-releasable educational gopher tortoise. If you followed anything I do with Augie, you know one of his favorite cheats are strawberries. You can see he has no tongue there. And take a look at those feet. He has got those elephant-like feet that he would use to dig. He also has natural vegetation in his enclosure, so he eats things like grass and weeds, like you can see in this other video here. He's ripping them up and having a grand old time, but you can even see that he has sand on his back. So he is made to be on land. He cannot swim, would not do well in the water. So if you ever see a gopher tortoise, appreciate it. Even if they're down by the water, leave them be, don't touch them. And whatever you do, please don't try to save them by putting them into the ocean. They can't swim. They belong on land. All right. So in the world, there are seven species of sea turtles. You have your leatherbacks, your Kemp's Ridley, all olive ridley, green sea turtle, hawksbill, flatback, and loggerhead. Of these seven, only five are found in our waters and really only about three nest on our beaches. So we don't have flatbacks here. Those are in Australia. We also don't have olive ridleys here, but we do get hawksbills that swim in our waters occasionally when it gets warm enough, um, but they don't nest here. They don't nest in high numbers at all, really, in the state of Florida. We do predominantly have loggerheads. We have greens. We have leatherbacks. And occasionally, we get graced with the presence of a Kemp's Ridley. So well, I'm going to go through each of those one by one and kind of give you some cool characteristics, things to note about them. So loggerhead sea turtles refer to their large head and they utilize that large head to crush things open so they're carnivores they want to eat things like clams and crabs and things that have a hard shell they want to eat meat and they're only about three feet long and 300 ish pounds which is actually pretty small for a sea turtle <laughs> and these guys are found in temperate and tropical waters throughout the world and they are by are the most common nester not only in St. John's County but in the state of Florida. They easily make up well over 95% of the, all the nests that we get here in throughout the state. Then we have green sea turtles. So green sea turtles actually do not refer to the color of the shell. So while in this picture this turtle looks super vibrant and green and you think maybe that's where they get their name, not really. They actually get their name because they eat so much green stuff. They eat so much ocean lettuce that they actually turn green. The same kind of concept with flamingos when they eat so many shrimp and shellfish, they turn pink. Also, the same exact idea if you feed your child too many carrots and sweet potatoes and they turn orange. How do I know that that's true? Because I have the baby pictures to prove it. So thanks, mom and dad. That's embarrassing. But yeah, if you eat too much of anything, sometimes it can change the color. And in a sea turtle's case, they eat so much green stuff, they actually turn green. Their body fat is literally green. These guys are an average of about five feet long. They can get up to about 500 pounds. Now that'd be a humongous green sea turtle. They're usually closer to that 300 end. These guys are found in tropical and subtropical waters, and they're the largest of all the hard-shelled turtles in the world. Notice I said hard-shelled, and we'll get to that in a minute. 
These guys are the second most common nester here in St. Johns County. They tend to have really up years and then lull years or like every other year, more or less nester. But these guys won't start coming in until it gets warmer out. So I mentioned at the very beginning that sea turtle nesting season started May 1st. We won't start to see these guys usually till closer to June. They wait till the water temperatures are a lot warmer and they'll actually lay their nests further back in the dunes. They're known to get up into the vegetation to go ahead and lay their nests. And this sea turtle is exactly why I said the largest hard shell turtle for green sea turtles because these sea turtles take the cake. Um, they are humongous. These are your leatherback turtles. They can be up to 1,200 pounds is the average. The largest ever recorded was over 2,000 pounds, which is mind blowing. When these guys come up onto the sand, it is like a small car is coming up to lay its eggs. They can be on average about seven feet long, that's taller than me. And their name refers to that leathery back. So that's why I said hard shell turtles for the green sea turtles are the largest because these guys don't have a hard shell. They have a leathery back and that leathery back allows them to dive deep distances into water. If they had a hard shell, diving those extensive distances in the water would actually crack their shell from the pressure of the water above them. So that leathery back allows them to go further down without having things crack, because that would be bad. They primarily eat jellyfish, and the inside of their mouth looks like this. They have all these crazy teeth in their mouth to eat their jellyfish and send it on down the pipe because jellyfish can be a little slippery. You don't want them to get away. And we only get a handful of these every year in St. John's County, usually somewhere around 10 to 20. And they're the first ones to come in. So every year we say sea turtle nesting season starts May 1st, but without fail every year, somewhere around mid to late April, we do start to get our leatherback nests. So we already have a couple of leatherback nests on our beach and they'll still continue to roll on in here, hopefully. Um, but these guys, like I said, are absolutely massive. They're so big. <laughs> there's no mistaking that there's a leatherback that nested um, that next morning because she leaves such an impression. Then our kind of mystery nester is Kemp's Ridley. So in the past few years, we got have one or two of these a season. Some seasons we don't have any. It's sort of mysterious that they're nesting here because they're typically found in the Gulf of Mexico and um, like in the Texas, Mexico area, not really in Florida. So um, we're lucky to have them nesting here on the Atlantic side of Florida. Usually they're on the other side. But what's really cool is these guys nest during the day. So all the other turtles we talk about nest at night. They come up at night. They hatch at night. These guys come up in the middle of the day. So we have really good documentation that we know these are Kemp's Ridley nests. In addition, they're a lot smaller than all the other sea turtles we talked about. They weigh somewhere around 100 pounds, and they're usually only about three feet long. These guys are the smallest and most endangered species of sea turtles. So now that we're kicking off a new sea turtle nesting season, you never know what's gonna happen. Hopefully we get another Kemp's Ridley nest or two because it's really neat when they do come up. And usually because it's during the day, someone gets to see it and experience it, which is a, a great. So how does that nesting process work? Now, once again, we say sea turtle nesting season is from May 1st, October 31st. The sea turtles don't read the textbook, right? So I already told you we get some of our leatherbacks usually about mid-April, and sometimes our nests are not done incubating until after October 31st. So those are just general federal guidelines that put a date on the season, but things do happen outside of that window. So for everything but the Kemp's Ridley, the female will come up at night, she will wait till it's dark out, and she will pull herself up onto the sand. Now, she has flippers that are awesome for swimming, not so great for walking. So it takes a lot of energy for that mama turtle to be able to pull her hundreds of pounds or thousand something pounds if she's a leatherback up to the sand. She's gonna put her head into the sand and basically sniff it and test it to see if it's dry or not because she wants her eggs to be up past the high tide line because if it's below the high tide line, 
her nest will get inundated with water and that nest won't make it. So we talked about how these turtles breathe air. Well, their eggs breathe air too. So if their nests are covered in water for too long a period of time, that nest will fail. So she has to continue to crawl up past that high tide line, usually giving herself a big enough buffer to then go ahead and lay her nest. So she will go ahead and dig a body pit and then she'll use her back flippers to carefully scoop out the sand. And those will create her nest cavity. Her nest cavity can be two to three feet deep, depending on the type of turtle. And then she'll deposit anywhere from 80 to about 120 eggs. Now remember, they have to be soft, otherwise they would break. She covers that nest and she heads on back to the water. She says, good luck, little baby turtles, and she is on her way. Now she'll repeat that process about every two weeks for potentially four to seven nests in a season. And then usually she takes the year off. She's like, all right, I'm done, I'm out. I'm gonna go on a vacation in Mexico, hang out there and take a year off and I'll be back the year after. So once she's gone, she's done her motherly job to put a, that nest in a safe spot. And from there, that nest will sit there and incubate. So Typically, depending on the species, anywhere from 45 to 75 days after that nest is initially laid, those sea turtles will hatch. And they will poke through the egg with a little tooth that they have at the front of their beak, their little egg tooth. And they will break out of the egg and they'll work together, all climbing on top of each other to dig their way out of the nest. And then once they get out, it is a giant turtle race all the way to the ocean. And then once they get there, they're super teeny tiny. They're smaller than the palm of my hand. Unfortunately, they're little tasty raviolis to everything in the ocean. The little turtle raviolis, they're delicious. Things love to eat them. And so only about one in a thousand of those hatchlings will actually make it to adulthood. So that's why she lays so many nests in a season. It's great that we have actually had record number of nests on our beach last year. So in the 2019 season, we actually had over a thousand nests, which is crazy because the prior record was only about 860 nests. So we're in an upward trajectory. We have no idea what the 2020 season is gonna bring. Hopefully we smash other sea turtle nesting numbers. That would be great to see. Um, but I do wanna let you know that just because we are not utilizing our beaches does not mean that we're going to have a record season or that turtles are taking advantage of people not being here so they're nesting. Nobody sent a memo to the turtles to say, hey, the people aren't on the beach, go nest, go nest, go nest, right? They're just naturally responding to the temperature of the ocean, the changes in daytime, and that's why they're coming to nest. So we're on par, we have the same number of nests, you know, prior to May 1st that we had last year. So nothing's crazy exploding here because we aren't on our beaches. Now the conditions are definitely better for sea turtles, right? So there's less people on the beach at night, less distractions, less lights. So that could be a contributing factor to the success of females that are coming up to nest, right? If there's less false crawls, but there's not necessarily this huge boom of sea turtles coming to nest on the beaches just because we're not there. There, no one sent them a sea turtle underwater memo. All right, so I wanna show you a video of a female actually nesting on the beach. So this was taken with proper permits and with red light filters. So the red lights don't impact the sea turtles. And this is a mama sea turtle who's come up and she's gone ahead, she's dug that body cavity, she's dug her egg chamber. And sometimes mama sea turtles are um, known for looking like they're crying when they're laying their nest. That's just those salt glands in the, her eyes that would normally be getting the salt water out of her eyes basically tearing up on land. So it's not necessarily crying, but it kind of looks like she's crying. So this is what it looks like when the eggs pop out and you'll see exactly why they're soft and they're not hard like chicken eggs. See how that egg just bounced? That was a chicken egg, it would crack. That would be bad. 
So she takes about an hour to sometimes two hours to complete this whole process of coming up onto the sand, digging the hole, laying the eggs, covering the nest, and then going back. So once she's completed, she uses those back flippers, and sometimes she'll use those front flippers too to throw sand everywhere and cover up that nest because she wants to make sure that it's nice and secure. But then she has to now, after giving birth to 100, potentially 120 eggs, make her way back to the ocean. It's a very labor-intensive process for a sea turtle. And you can see when she starts to move, just how awkward they are on land. Like I said before, they have flippers that are great for swimming, not so great at all for walking on sand, and definitely not great for moving a couple hundred pounds on sand. You'll notice the way that she's moving, she'll create a distinctive pattern through the sand. So that's how our volunteers in the morning are able to find these sea turtle nests because it looks like a giant tractor tire just rolled through the beach. So it's pretty distinctive in the morning to the turtle volunteers and depending on the way that track was laid, they know which type of sea turtle it is. And so after that nest is laid and about 45 days later, this is then what happened. So those little itty bitty bit of turtles have made their way to the top of the nest and they are on their way to the ocean. Now they hatch at night and they're typically guided by the light of the moon or the reflection of the moon over the water. And if you took people away from the equation, nine times out of 10, that horizon line where the water is would be the brightest point. And so that would guide the sea turtles of where to go, of how to get to the water. Well, unfortunately, people have lots of things lit up or lots of artificial light. And so occasionally if it's near a beach, nesting beach, these sea turtles will get disoriented and they will instead head towards the human-made light and not the ocean, which is obviously bad. These turtles need to be in the ocean. So it's really important that we keep our beaches dark because the sea turtles dig in the dark. You can see they come out in really large numbers. So you typically will get a huge batch of tens to the whole nest going all at once and they're all just fighting their route, and it's just a giant little baby turtle race all the way to the ocean. One of their biggest predators at this point, um, a lot of people think it's gonna be birds, but at night, they don't have as much to worry about from birds. It's actually gonna be ghost crabs. So ghost crabs will come grab these little babies and take them on back for dinner. Pretty cool. Super cute. I'll let you watch that for another minute here. Just because it's so cute. How could you not like that? All right. So these sea turtles, they go out just like you saw, and they swim for miles to get to the Sargasso Sea. And that Sargasso Sea is this floating rack line of algae and seaweed and all this stuff that they can hide in that they can eat, that they can grow strong. But when these little baby turtles with their itty bitty baby flippers swim all the way out there, they're exhausted. They just wanna float and hang out. Well, sometimes after they get out there and they've been hanging out there for a little while, large storms like nor'easters can push them back onto shore in that rack line. And we get what's called washbacks. We have a whole washback season where we have dedicated volunteers who go out, they walk the beaches specifically looking for these baby turtles so that we can go ahead and get them to the sea turtle hospital to be evaluated and be taken care of. So when they get to the sea turtle hospital, looks a little something like this. This is video from the sea turtle hospital at the UF Whitney lab. And these are all little teeny tiny washbacks that are hanging out in their little washback pool. They wait for them to get nice and strong and um, fatten them up a little bit. And then they go ahead and take them out into the ocean. They don't make them do that journey miles offshore. Again, that's exhausting. They typically take a boat and kind of give them a little bit of a head start. 
So there are lots of threats to sea turtles and I've touched on some of them so far, but I just wanna go over them again. One is beach lighting. We really wanna make sure we keep our beaches dark for the sea turtles. Any sort of yellow or white light can cause a disorientation and send turtles in the wrong direction, both little baby turtles and mama turtles. And we want nothing more than for all of those turtles to make it safely back into the ocean. They're losing habitat, so they're losing, losing nice healthy dunes, nice healthy beaches, places to actually nest. There are lots of instances throughout Florida where the high tide line goes straight to a man-made structure and there's no longer any room for sea turtles to nest. So that's super unfortunate. There's also marine debris, which is huge on two fronts. One, because it can cause a tangling factor as with a lot of fishing line and fishing gear but there's also an ingestion factor. So these sea turtles, like we said, the leatherbacks love, love, love jellyfish. Well, things like balloons and plastic bags in the water can oftentimes look like jellyfish. And if they eat something like that, there's a, a really slim chance they're not gonna recover. Just think if we ate a plastic bag or a balloon, right? We'd have to go to the hospital. So unless somewhere along the lines that these animals get picked up and taken to a wildlife facility, their chances of survival are really slim. There's a really scary study out there that says by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean by, than fish. I don't know about you, but there's something really wrong with our world if there's more plastic than fish swimming in our ocean. Um, so we wanna make sure that we limit our amount of marine debris and our contri contri contribution to marine debris. Climate change. So one thing we haven't talked about yet is that gender for sea turtles is dependent on temperature. So hot chicks, cool dudes. So if the nest is really hot, you get a bunch of females. If the nest is cooler, you get males. And sometimes you get half and half where the bottom is cooler and the top is warmer. But there's been some studies that have come out in recent years that show not only in Florida, but also in Australia, nests are hatching out at a 99% rate of females, which for right now isn't as big of a problem because those little baby turtles will take about 20 to 30 years to reach maturity. And so for the time being, there are plenty of male and female turtles. However, in generations and decades to come, if we are consistently hatching out only female turtles, that could be a huge problem for the species and we could literally watch it decline in slow motion because that species, every species really, not just that species, it takes two to tango, all right? So you can't just have a whole population of just females and not have any males. Um, that just, that math doesn't add up. So it, there's a lot of research going into why it's happening in relation to climate change, what we can do, are they shifting their ranges further north? So it's a up and coming field of study that hopefully they have some breakthroughs in the next few years for. And also, while these sea turtles are heavily protected here in the United States, thanks to U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Endangered Species Act, they are not protected internationally. So as soon as they leave U.S. waters, they are in international waters and they go to other countries where unfortunately they don't have the same protections that we have on them here. So there is a huge trade industry for sea turtle shells, for sea turtle skins to make leather, for sea turtle meat, and for sea turtle eggs. And so in other countries where they don't have these kinds of protections, they are being predated upon. So that's something to think about if you do travel internationally, um, watch what you buy internationally and what it's made of, particularly jewelry and things like that, if it looks like it might be made of a shell of some sort. So occasionally, if you're walking the beach, you might see a washed up sea turtle, or maybe you are walking the beach during washback season and you see a washback baby sea turtle. First things first, keep your distance. So it's illegal to harass or touch a sea turtle. Um, and this is a great rule of thumb for really any wildlife. Keep your distance, um, let the professionals handle it. See if it's lethargic or entangled because you're gonna wanna report that when you call the sheriff's non-emergency number. So if you find something that's tangled up here on our St. John's County beaches, call our non-emergency number because they'll dispatch the appropriate people to go ahead and handle that situation. 
And if you see a dead sea, sea turtle, report that as well, because we do reports on those dead sea turtles. We wanna keep track of what's washing up on our beaches. So once again, if you find anything that's washed up, go ahead and keep your distance. And this goes beyond sea turtles to things like dolphins and whales and manatees. Um, just leave them alone, <laughs> let the professionals handle it, and go ahead and call in the sheriff's department and they'll go ahead and get the right people on the beach. These animals that we're talking about, sea turtles and any mammals that wash up, they all have one thing in common. They all breathe air. So if they've washed in and they're still alive, they're suffering. So we don't want to push them back because they want to just basically get to a point on that beach where they can rest their head on the sand and not have to think about coming to the surface to breathe. Because just like you and I, if we're struggling and we're really sick in the water, there's the potential we can drown if we don't get back to the surface to get air. It's the exact same thing with these animals. So you can do way more harm by trying to set them free and push them back into the ocean. And more than likely, they will just strand again further on down the beach. And all you've done is delay help getting to that animal. So go ahead, call the non-emergency number and leave that animal alone and let the authorities handle it. What you can do to help sea turtles, reduce your beach lighting, keep those beaches dark at night. So whenever we go back to normal beach activities in life, um, if you're out on the beach at night past dark, um, watch your flashlight use. You should not have any white lights on the beach. If you feel you need a flashlight to walk the beach at night, make sure it has a red film over it or it's a red light because that red wavelength doesn't interfere with sea turtles. You're gonna wanna reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse. We wanna make sure that we keep our beaches clean. Like I said earlier, our projections are that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Um, we all need to do our part to make sure that we don't allow that to happen. So we need to reduce our plastic consumption. We need to reuse things instead of using plastic. Definitely properly recycle and start to refuse things like single-use plastic straws. Get involved. So watch out when the world reopens. We'll have things like beach cleanups. Um, you are always welcome to participate in the washback program, which is run through the St. John's County Environmental Department. You can um, also volunteer for your local turtle patrol. So there are lots of things you can do specifically related to sea turtles that are all very hands-on. You can fill in your holes at the beach and also knock down sand castles. So these tiny little itty bitty baby turtles that we talked about that are about the size of my hand, huge sand castles look like Mount Everest and holes at the beach look like the Grand Canyon. So they have teeny tiny flippers that once again are made for swimming, not great for walking on land. So these little baby turtles, they already have a hard life. One in a thousand make it to adulthood. Let's not make it any harder on them. So fill in your holes at the beach, knock down your sand castles so that those sea turtles have a nice clear path to and from the ocean. Take all of your beach gear with you. There really should be no reason that you're leaving things like tents and chairs and coolers and things overnight at the beach. Um, obviously you can't have any of those things on the beach right now, but when we reopen, when you go to the beach, don't leave them there. So sea turtles can become entangled in all of that equipment. There are really sad stories of mama sea turtles coming up to nest and getting stuck underneath beach chairs and getting entangled in tent lines. So take all of that stuff. Let's leave our beaches nice and clean and clear for those sea turtles to come on through. And be a responsible dog owner. So follow leash laws. If your dog is not in the water, it should be on a leash. And we want to make sure our dogs are not digging around sea turtle nests because we don't want them to be just all right, well, this is the part I would normally ask for questions if we were in person, but if you have any, feel free to leave them in the comment section and I'll try to get you answers as soon as possible. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation and you're super excited about sea turtle season just like I am. I hope we have another record-breaking year. I encourage all of you, um, even if it's just to get out and enjoy walking the beach right now, you can do it safely and social distance. The beaches are a beautiful place to get 
some exercise and some fresh air and check out and look for those sea turtle nests because they'll be rolling in every day um, for the next couple of months. So thank you guys for joining me. Bye.